Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel. I'm Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. This is training vlog number 18. We've got some questions from you guys. We've got some form checks from you guys. And then we've got some uh, form checks of our own as we get into it. So we'll start off with a question from Marcus Bernard. He says, I have questions on nutrition. It's always something I felt most unsure about with my training. I'm 5'10", 185 pounds, and I would estimate uh, to be around 22 to 23% body fat. Currently, I eat around 2,300 calories a day, typically 300 grams of carbohydrates, 145 grams of protein, and 50 grams of fat. Uh, I'm not opposed to getting bigger and gaining weight, but 85 kilos also feels like it's plenty of weight for my height to still be strong. Uh, just for information on my training, I'm still a novice doing linear progression. My last session, I squatted 90 kilos for three sets of five. I benched 60 kilos for three sets of five, and I deadlifted 100 kilos or 220 pounds for one set of five. I started with strong lifts five by five with just the bar for 12 weeks. And then I had a month off due to life. When I returned uh, to training three weeks ago, I deloaded around 30% and I'm building back up. Uh, my weight seems to stay stable for the first for the last few weeks, but 85 kilos, such a high body fat, is pretty chubs. Uh, if I maintain this diet, would it be reasonable to assume that my strength and muscle will continue to grow while I lose body fat, or would I be better served increasing my calorie intake to around 3,000 and keeping the 55%, 25%, 20% split? I guess that's for carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Uh, I understand there are plenty of other factors, so I've tried to include as much information without getting too detailed. <laughs> and sending a crazy essay. Uh, I'm also vegan and I take uh, some vegan protein supplement once a day, usually with breakfast. I typically train three times a week prior to breakfast. Whew. All right, Marcus. Hey man, thanks for the email. And honestly, questions like this are hard to answer without a very important uh, piece of information, which are, what are your goals? What do you want out of your training? What makes training worthwhile for you? What's gonna keep you coming back to the gym day after day after day, year after year after year? That's very uh, germane to this question. So that being said, I think that you also need to make sure that we have uh, some objective data uh, in addition to really laying out, you know, why are you even training in the first place? So we have your height, we don't have your waist size, uh, we have your weight, uh, and then your body fat test, you didn't tell me how you discern that, you're just guessing. So <clears throat> I think using something that's fairly repeatable if you're going to use body fat analysis uh, is reasonable. So the Navy body test, uh, the Navy body fat test, which is online, is not the most accurate uh, body fat uh, um, a test, but it is free and it's repeatable. And you know, if you're gonna use it, that seems reasonable rather than paying for a DEXA scan or a hydrostatic weighing, which again, none of these tests, none of the body fat tests are actually gonna change what you do, meaning that you're not gonna adjust your calorie intake based on what your body fat is because the body fat is just a number. And so even if you're involved in an aesthetic sport, um, you're going to be going by a subjective sort of interpretation of what your body fat is. Uh, the only reason I would use body fat analysis is, with any of my clients is if I think that it's going to increase their compliance with the training and the nutrition interventions that I'm making. Otherwise, the body fat percentage is kind of useless. There's no real sort of like cut point where it makes you do something different based on just the number. So I think the mirror does a pretty good job. Uh, that being said, if the... Um, you know, knowing what your body fat is exactly keeps you more compliant, then you can use it. Uh, that being said, I don't know what your goals are, which is going to tie into this subjective sort of information. So what do you want out of your training? We alluded to that earlier, the, how that's important. Uh, and then what's your history with your uh, nutrition and training? So, you know, how long have you been training your whole life? Uh, what's your nutrition look like? You know, as far as hey, were you always, you know, overweight or have you recently gained weight? What, uh, how's your weight uh, trended the past few weeks on these, uh, uh, this sort of intake? So. This is, it's hard to actually give you an answer without just answering more, you know, asking more questions. So I think something that'd be more useful to everybody and probably to you as well is to kind of figure out who should gain weight, who shouldn't gain weight. And, and you know, there's sort of absolute, like you should definitely do this. And then there's relative sort of recommendations. So as far as uh, who should gain weight, absolute sort of um, uh, recommendation that you have to gain weight. There are no buts about it. You need to do it now. If you have a medical condition that would improve with weight gain, um, you know, and there's a, uh, some eating disorders, there are some uh, malnourishment uh, uh, diseases, there are um, 
uh, other sort of pathologies that would do better, that people do better with weight gain, then you should gain weight. But that being said, if if you fall into that category, you're likely uh, need to be under the care of a med or under the supervision of a medical provider whilst doing that because there are some complications that can occur and just you know going off the reservation uh, may not be so good for your health. So that would be one absolute uh, indication to you have to gain weight. Everything else is a relative indication, you know. Um, so that's the singular absolute indication. So relative indications for gaining weight would be if you're underweight, which I'm going to define as your Waist uh, circumference is well within normal limits. Uh, you're not overweight or obese based on the BMI, okay? And uh, if your performance would increase uh, with, uh, and you have no contraindication for losing uh, uh, weight. So it, basically what I'm getting at is that if you are underweight and your, your goals and your perform, uh, particularly your performance goals are likely to be reached if you gain weight and you don't have any reason why you shouldn't gain weight, then you would fall into a relative indication to gain some weight. Um, there's no set rate on which is optimal, uh, what is optimal for this, because people respond differently to training and also different nutrition interventions. So it's very difficult to say, this is how many pounds you should be gaining per week. This is how many pounds you should be gaining per month. That just, any number there is just one, wholly made up. And then two, does not uh, uh, transfer to the broad population. So it's not very uh, generalizable because it's just gonna be um, you know, something made up and people respond very, very differently. Uh, so my, and then moving on, who should lose weight? Uh, absolute indications to lose weight, meaning you don't pass go, don't collect $200, you need to lose weight now. If you have a medical condition that would improve with weight loss, then guess what? You should lose weight. So conditions where insulin uh, resistance is one of the causes or obesity is one of the causes or somebody with a, a waist circumference that's higher uh, than our cut points, which are 37 inches for a female, 40 inches for a male, all those folks would do much, much better by losing weight now. There's no reason to delay that. In fact, that's an absolute indication for weight loss. So uh, as far as a relative indication for losing weight, if your personal goals, right? So what do you want out of training or your performance goals uh, would be better reached if you lost weight, i.e. moving down a weight class, for instance, then those are all reasonable, you know, relative indications to lose weight. Um, my gestalt uh, over this particular situation is you're not terribly well trained, okay? You haven't been training for that long as well as, as a part of that. And then we don't really uh, have a lot of good hard data on what do you exactly weigh, what's your body fat exactly, what's your waist. Um, and so I think the best thing you could do given all of that and also in the context of taking a month off due to life, I get this sort of impression that we're, we're starting out. We're rather new to this and you're not underweight. I mean, 5'10", 185, sure. Are you underweight for like a world, you know, elite level power lifter, Olympic weightlifter? I mean, yeah, sure. But that's not where you're at in your training. So my recommendation at this point would probably be to maintain your weight. Um, uh, provided your waist isn't, or isn't above uh, those sort of cutoff points. And then at the end of your novice phase, then you get to reassess. Um, I would expect that your lean body mass would increase and your body fat would decrease being that you are untrained and that it's likely that you're carrying some extra body fat. I think that's a reasonable, uh, that's a reasonable thing here. I don't think that you should rapidly gain weight. I think the most important thing is to figure out ways that you can uh, incentivize your, your own training, meaning that you don't take a month off due to life, meaning that you are uh, uh, aggressively pursuing improving your, your training outcomes and, and you want to get to the gym on a regular basis. I think those will be uh, the, big, the big things. You know, I, I, I don't see a lot of good evidence uh, either anecdotal and, and certainly not in the scientific literature suggesting that people need to rapidly gain weight during the earliest phases of their training to see long-term improvements. I mean, if you gain an extra 20 pounds during your uh, novice phase, you know, the first three or four months of your training, that doesn't mean anything for your long-term outcomes. And you can verify that by all the people who really ground out, milked out, you know, uh, and gained a bunch of weight during their LP. And what do they end up squatting five or six years later? Again, the, if that was an effective solution or if that was effectively setting people up for long-term performance gains, we would have a lot of 600 pound squatters just walking around and I'm still looking for them. Um, this is not to sort of, you know, poke fun at anybody who did that. I just think that we have to really critically assess uh, our decision making and figure out, hey, why are we doing this? So I think most people probably want to get more jacked and most people want to get stronger and, and probably not willing to say, hey, I'm just going to gain a bunch of weight 
uh, and, and you know, make my 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 belly really round just to get a little bit stronger on LP. I think we just have to say this is a, a longer term process. We're gonna have to spread this out. And uh, will you ever have to weigh more than you are comfortable weighing? I mean, probably if if strength is is that high up your priority list. But you know, if aesthetics are a, a big part of your uh, motivation to train, or, and if health certainly is a big mot uh, part of the reason why you train, then I, I don't know if it's worth making that compromise. You may not end up as strong as you otherwise would be, okay? But if that's not your goal, then does that really matter? And just the kind of take home point from this is, if you squatted 455 versus 500, does it really change your life? It's something to consider. Which actually is a nice segue into our next question. Okay, our next question is from Daisy Caldwell. He says, you guys, you, in particular, speak about minimum levels of aerobic conditioning for health outcomes being some number of metabolic units and equate that to being able to climb a few sets of stairs without getting out of breath. So do you have an equivalent view on what level of strength is a minimum for health outcomes? I think I've seen, heard uh, Rip say that a minimum level of strength to aim for is being able to press three quarters of your body weight, squat 1.75 times your body weight and deadlift twice your body weight, but I'm not sure what his reasoning is. Uh, thanks, Dace. Well, all right, let's dig into this. So the sort of cut point for uh, how much aerobic conditioning um, you need in order to not suffer a premature, uh, uh, an increased rate of premature uh, morbidity or mortality, meaning disease or death, um, is about eight metabolic equivalents. The metabolic equivalent is the ratio of the working metabolic rate to the resting metabolic rate. Uh, one met is defined as one kilocalorie per kilo of body weight per hour, and is roughly equivalent to the energy cost of just sitting there quietly, not talking, not eating, not doing anything like that. Uh, also, there's a correlation to oxygen uptake, uh, which is about 3.5 milliliters per kilo per minute. So a lot of this longevity data started in 1989. A series of papers was published from the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study. So basically Blair et al. looked at a big section of the population and tried to correlate a person's work capacity or their aerobic capacity um, and what how that related to their all-cause mortality risk. And so if you were able to put out nine metabolic equivalents if you were a guy or 10 metabolic equivalents if you were a female, then you suffered from the lowest uh, all-cause mortality. So basically that cut point was higher than eight. Uh, as far as strength, uh, there are a lot of studies looking into this, but it's not gonna make you happy. And it's not gonna make me happy to some degree because I think it's harder to interpret and the biggest problem is most of these studies look at hand grip strength or leg extension. Uh, and you're like, oh, well, why don't they just use a squat or a bench press or a deadlift? It's like, well, that's harder to control for, meaning not only is it harder to get a bunch of people to participate in, but it's harder to standardize because, you know, you can't take a million people and have them all squat uh, below parallel in this multi-center trial. It's just not, it's not gonna happen. Whereas you can do that with hand grip and you can do that with a leg extension. Uh, in any event, the best studies that we show, uh, that we've seen on this do in fact suggest that those who are the strongest as assessed by either the hand grip or the leg extension do suffer the uh, least or the lowest rate of all cause mortality. And this has actually been extrapolated out even into adolescent strength levels um, and cardiovascular disease. And uh, it gets nuanced there with the amount of exercise and, and uh, some other uh, cardiac uh, stuff. But to answer your question, yes, there's a connection, but we just don't know what the cutoff is. I can with 100% certainty say that a three quarter body weight press a, and a twice body weight deadlift are likely far in excess of the strength levels needed to optimize sort of just all cause mortality, mainly because something like that is multi has multiple variables <laughs> that are being uh, uh, taken into consideration. So it's not just how strong you are. Um, and that's likely much stronger than a lot of these people uh, um, on the hand grip and the leg extension. So I, I think those numbers are wholly made up, uh, you know, a three quarter press, three, three quarter body weight press and a twice body weight deadlift. Um, so this, there and you know begs the question how strong is strong enough from a health perspective and i don't have an answer there i think the process of training in and of itself uh, even if you're not getting stronger which so then at that point you're, it's just activity i think that's very very important not only to maintaining uh musculoskeletal changes that we need uh, throughout our lifetime but then also uh likely preventing disease now how strong do you have to get well that's a different question but i think the process of training and resistance training in particular 
uh, is very, very useful for long-term health and uh, not only developing health, but then maintaining it and also maintaining one's independence. So do you need to be able to deadlift twice body weight? I mean, no, probably not. Uh, it, how, what kind of deadlift do you need to, to maximize your sort of health returns from strength training? I, I don't know the answer to that either, but I would submit to you that the process of regularly engaging in resistance training, uh, specifically uh, barbell training, is highly likely to benefit someone's, uh, someone's health uh, long term. Okay, third question, because it's been a minute. Uh, Thomas Volsov, uh, he says, ah, hi, I'm Thomas and I write you from France. Hey, uh, why do you care so much about the press? For powerlifting, having a fourth lift to train will take time and recovery away from competition lift. And for hypertrophy, the press doesn't really train different muscles from the bench press. Thank you. Okay, so this is kind of a, um, a nuanced question. Again, I feel like I'm becoming a meme. I don't care about the press, just as an aside. like. If you don't want to train the press, don't train the press. I think that its utility in a general strength and conditioning program is relatively high because it is a compound lift that trains a lot of muscle mass in a different motor pattern, a different pressing motor pattern than the bench press. It's standing, your kinetic chain is very long. And I think, uh, you know, putting things overhead and getting good at doing that is a reasonable, large set of uh, physical uh, skills that, that one should, you know, there's probably benefit in developing. And so from a powerlifting perspective, the only reason that you'd wanna put the press in is if you wanted to include more pressing work in general, um, but you were afraid of doing too much benching uh, too quickly, meaning that if you had somebody who you were just increasing the amount of times they were benching in a given week, uh, and then you added a ton more bench pressing, you run the risk of acutely increasing their fatigue levels a little bit too high and they may uh, get some pain from that. So you could you know, sort of temper that by having a press slot in there. Um, again, I don't think that it keeps your shoulders healthy or, or does anything like that, but from a general uh, development standpoint, the press is very, you know, very good and I don't see the bench press being better necessarily. They're just different and they're both training your ability to press. Uh, just a general mo uh, motor pattern. For powerlifting, the press correct, you correctly state, is not terribly useful, but you know, you may need to use it to offset some of uh, the fatigue or overuse injury potential that if you just did regular bench press all the time. And that's one of the reasons why variations can be useful as well, which I think um, have, uh, have merit instead of just doing the competition bench all the time. And therefore, so from a novice or non-competitive powerlifter perspective, I think that uh, not training the press is probably to uh, your detriment. Um, you know, but if you're a competitive powerlifter and you're high level and you've been training for a long time and you've never pressed, you can live a full and complete life without pressing. That's fine. Okay, so we're going to move on to some form checks. First one is Christopher from Sweden. This is 112 and a half kilos. Uh, first thing, I really wish you'd get some lifting shoes. And then also, if you're gonna squat outside the rack, probably should use safeties, you know? You might pass out in the middle of a rep and <laughs> crumple over. Yeah, and your knees need to go further forward too at the bottom. That's why your back is in a slightly flexed position. Yeah, so I would get some shoes. I would push your knees further forward on the way down. I would tuck your chin down also a little bit more. I think that's what I would do here. I'm just look at your depth on this last one. Yeah, depth is fine. So, that's what I would do. Oh, that's four. Yeah, that one, your knees just slid forward the whole time. So, yeah, knees further forward on the way down. Get some lifting shoes. Use safeties uh, outside the rack and uh, keep your chin down. And then uh, I would see what that looks like. All right, so this is Kevin. Kevin F. Uh, looks like 205, gonna do this for a set of four. I see that you're benching on your toes, that's fine, if you like. I think you're touching far too low, and you're also kind of like bouncing the bar off the bottom, so I would touch higher on your chest, your elbows are gonna be out a little bit further, and uh, yeah, that's what I would do. A little higher on your chest, elbows are gonna be out a little bit further. That's That would be my recommendation there. Also, the weight was very light, and if you're gonna pause it, keep it dead still. All right, so this is Nithilan uh, Kamalaknan. Yeah, I probably messed that up. This is 80 kilos. You know, so I think these plates are actually short, meaning that I don't think they're 450 millimeters tall, but you know. The other thing is that you're cutting your body off in the frame at the top, but it looks like you're not locking out your deadlift. So stand up straight at the top. 
Uh, and then I think your hips are too low. Yeah. Yep. So I'll get your hips up about two inches or inch and a half or so. And, uh, you're also really extending your spine. I would actually have you brace down to make a more neutral spine. Everyone's going to say gain weight. You already know that. Oh, this is 685. I, uh, messed up the uh, camera angle. So we get a nice sweet transition. So I pulled this for my single. Yeah, I rated that an eight. So I'm happy there. Here's 585 I'm doing this for six sets of four. I switched the straps, uh, my back offset. So I don't tear my hands up. I think I could do a better job. Yeah, I'm happy on that lockout actually. And, and look at the plates. Yeah, they don't budge at all. And they're all my legs. I can see, I don't see it trace up my legs. I can actually, there's like a bald spot on my legs from the bar itself, which is funny. That's Austin. This is 605. Notice the static pause at the end. We do that for some grip work occasionally. This is 625. Yeah. And so we both rated that an eight for him, maybe a little less. But yeah, holding the bar at the end of your last work set or, or a heaviest set can help train the grip specifically for the deadlift. People always want to ask about, you know, farmer's walks or whatever. I'm like, well, it's a non-specific way to train grip endurance, not necessarily grip strength. And I think if you're talking about grip strength and deadlift, you should probably do it on the deadlift. This is what, 335, 345, 350, half board press. Yeah, so I pause these. Yeah, that looks fine. You can notice the bar goes back on the way up, so that's good. And this is the last exercise. So this is like a front squat, front squat harness for belt squats. Obviously I look like I'm about to die, but I like this. This is uh, for a nice little uh, uh, accessory for the squat. It does really want to pitch you forward, but yeah, my feet are staying flat on the box. Depth looks good. Yeah, the dismount, <laughs> help. Uh, so anyway, that was uh, training vlog number 18. There'll be another one up uh, tomorrow, training vlog 19. And if you want to submit some questions to us, or if you want to submit videos, the link uh, is in the description below on uh, how to do that. And then also some of the studies that I talked about in this particular vlog are also here. So please hit like if you dug the video, subscribe for all the latest content. We'll see you guys next time. Later.